All right. All right, welcome. We are uh, excited to once again, oops, actually, I'm going to move this. We're excited to once again be back at the Bimini Shark Lab. My name is Jillian. Um, I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids and um, live in Bimini, so really lucky to collect with this amazing facility. Um, Bimini is a tiny little island in the Bahamas. It's about 50 miles from Florida, so pretty close to the United States. And uh, Bimini has become world famous uh, for its sharks and for the work being done right here at the Shark Lab. Uh, if you guys have ever watched uh, Shark Week or uh, shark shows on Animal Planet or Discovery Channel, you've probably seen the lab. There's some really remarkable science that's happened here, things that we know about sharks because of the research done here. Um, this facility was started in 1990 by Jock Gruber as a base for his study on lemon sharks, which are one of the species that are very common here in Bimini, um, found from birth all the way to adulthood um, and every stage in between, which makes it really an amazing place to study these sharks, uh, as well as some other species. So today, um, I've got an amazing team from the lab. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and then we'll uh, let you guys meet our very special guest and talk a little bit about shark science. What is it? What does it look like? And how we do it? Oh, my gosh. We have our last class, I think. I think so. Hello. How are you? Hi. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Hi. All right. So if you guys just want to go ahead and mute your microphone um, for, for now. And then we'll introduce you in just a minute. Just wave and say hi to everybody. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to go ahead um, and let the team um, introduce themselves. And then again, yeah, we'll meet our very special guest. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Angela. I'm from the UK. And I'm the manager here at the lab. So my role basically consists of making sure that all the interns and any visiting scientists or anyone that comes to the lab has everything they need. I assist in the research. And then I like to take part in the education too. Hi guys, my name is Chessie. I'm the outreach coordinator at the lab. I'm from London, England as well. And um, I, uh, my job here at the lab is basically education and community outreach. So I'm in charge of running tours here. So if you are ever in Bimini and want to come see them, I can give you a tour of our facility and the little special friends we have out in the back. Um, and I'm also um, heavily involved in uh, education and, uh, uh, and assisting the research at the lab. Hey guys, I'm Sarah. I'm from Dallas, Texas, and I am one of the volunteers here at the Shark Lab, and I just help out with all the day-to-day -day activities that we do here. Cool. All right, so as we mentioned, um, we do have a special guest, so I'm going to show you guys. Um, so the research station here has pens out back and you can see out behind the building and if you think of pens that you might have seen cows and horses and sheep in um, it's kind of like that but it's in the ocean and there are no horses in there there are sharks so juvenile nurse and lemon sharks are, are kept out back for about 30 days and they're put in there so that all the interns can learn about them and how to safely handle them to collect research as you're going to get to see in a in a little bit also so the public can come visit take a tour learn about sharks um, and research that's being done so on these, these specific species. Um, so this little shark that we have is from one of the pens out back and will stay for about 30 days, get released in the exact spot it was found, um, but is really, really valuable for, for learning and research um, and also so that we can do things like this today and, and introduce you. So uh, what you might notice is when she comes down a little bit, I know, oh, I just have to try not to splash the computer as much. All right, so I'm just going to lift her up real quick so you guys, this is our friend, the nurse shark, right? So she's a juvenile, um, quite young, and you'll notice um, she looks quite different than what you might think a shark. Probably more like a catfish, right, with those barbels on the front. Um, so she's our special guest today, and what we're going to do um, is take you through a little bit about her anatomy um, and also some of the research, how we do it, what we use. Um, and go through a workup. But before we do that, we're going to meet each one of our classrooms. So when we announce your class, if you guys want to unmute your microphone, say a big hello to everybody, a, a very enthusiastic hello to the shark. Um, so we have Mrs. Martin, Miss Martin's grade one class. Can you say hello for us? Hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Miss Eggart's grade one. Can you guys say hello? 
One, two, three. Ah! <laughs> and then Miss Davis's grade four. Yes. Boy. And then Miss Yanox's grade eight. We don't want to squeeze the shark too tight. So I'm just going to. Okay. One second. I'm just going to wait for her to calm down. Okay. So she doesn't look like a normal shark. She doesn't look like what you would expect, like a great white or something to look like. But what all sharks have in common is that they're made from cartilage. So cartilage is what our ears and nose are made out of. So if you all give your nose and your ears a squeeze, can you feel how bendy and flexible they are? So that's how bendy and flexible a shark is. Um, and this is because they need to be able to fit into small crevices um, and um, it makes them very light in the water, so it keeps them in the mid-water. Um, so you can see how flexible this little girl is because she can pretty much bite her own tail. So that's, um, so that's what sharks are made of. Um, I'm just going to show you her. So pretty much sharks have the same senses as us, but they have like a couple of extra special ones, which I'll talk about later. But can you see that she has eyes? But now her eyes are quite small, and the reason why they're quite small is because nurse sharks pretty much spend most of their lives under ledges and um, around, rocky, um, around rocky places. So if they wanted to get inside the rocks, it's better if her eyes are small so they don't get scratched. So her eyes are very small. Um, she has something called nares, which is um, like our nostrils. So this helps her smell what she wants to eat. Now, sharks have a very, very strong sense of smell. Um, a lot of their brain is actually dedicated to um, being able to smell. Now, what sharks don't do with their nose is breathe. They use something called gills. These are their gills. Most sharks have five to seven gills. This little shark has five gills, but you can't see the fifth one because it's hiding behind the fourth one. Can you see how they're pumping? A lot of sharks need to continuously swim through the ocean to be able to breathe um, because they take in oxygen through their mouth, drink water through their mouth, and then the gills remove the oxygen. Some sharks never start swimming because if they do, then they can't breathe. But this little girl actually can do something called buccal pump. And that is she takes in the water as she's resting and she is able to remove the oxygen. And she uses special muscles around her mouth to do this. So even when we're holding her in this position, she's still able to breathe. Sharks have something called ampullae of Lorenzini on their snout. And that they are small holes uh, or pores filled, filled with jelly, which conducts electric pulses. Everything that's alive and has a heartbeat gives off an electric pulse. 
So this is a very unique sense to sharks and they can home in on their food. So if they can't see um, in like really um, dirty water, a lot of the time they use their electric sense to find their food. Um, they have something, their skin is very rough. If you rub it from head to tail, it's very smooth. If you rub it from the tail to the head, it's very rough. Uh, a little bit like sandpaper. And the reason for this is because their skin is made from dermal denticles, which is very similar to our teeth, and it actually means skin teeth. And the reason why they have skin teeth is because these scales are laid on top of each other um, and go to the tail, and they have little, like, um, like rivulets in them, which stops the water from sticking to the skin because um, the water can be very sticky. And so if it sticks to the skin, then the shark can't move through the water very quickly. Now, nurse sharks don't actually move that fast. But, and so they don't have um, lots of these different um, dermal denticles, but other sharks do. And because these sharks don't move that fast, there's, there are, there's dermal denticles are very different. And most sharks, all shark species have different shapes and different amounts of numbers of dermal denticles depending on what, um, what their behavior is. Um, they have ears like us as well. They have inner ears. So they're just two holes on the top of their head. You can't really see them. But these inner ears can just hear low frequency, like uh, splashing or some, uh, a person splashing. They're very in tune to these low frequencies, something that us as humans can't actually hear. So they have really good hearing too. I'm just going to show you their fins. Can you move that? So you can see that this little girl has different fins. So she has, these are pectoral fins, these uh, are dorsal fins, pelvic fins, an anal fin, and then a caudal fin. This is their tail. Now they all have different functions. So the dorsal fins keep them steady in the water and stop them from rolling. This little girl's dorsal fins are very far back on her body, and that mean that that stops her from getting stuck inside the um, inside the crevices it means she can fit under very well now she has just an upper tail a lot of species of shark have a lower tail as well like a great white and that's because they need that as extra propulsion to help them move through the water really fast and this little girl spends most of her time on the bottom so she doesn't need that lower part of her tail otherwise it would get stuck in the sand and also, because she doesn't move fast, she doesn't need it. And uh, the pectoral fins and the anal fins, uh, sorry, the, um, the pelvic fins um, give her lift, a little bit like an aeroplane. So if she needs to move up through the water column, then she'll use these fins to give her that extra lift. Um, I'm just going to show you how you can tell the difference between a male and a female. Do you want to? Yeah. Just keep it low. There you go. You can see. Yeah, just here, This is, you can see that this, if this was a male, these fins would actually be a little bit different and they would have um, stiff um, appendages and they are called clusters and that is what, how you can tell the difference between a male and a female because this little girl doesn't have any at all. Um, teeth. Okay, so um, different sharks have different types of teeth. And this little girl has um, flat, crushing plates rather than really pointy teeth like, um, like a white shark. Because, for example, a white shark will eat marine mammals. So it needs really pointy teeth to be able to um, tear through the skin. This little girl spends most of her time eating lobsters and conch and shellfish and things like that. So she needs to have really good, flat, crushing teeth to be able to get through the shells. Um, she also uses the muscles around her mouth to suck things out of their shells too. So, yeah. Anything else? Okay, so that's from, enough from me, and then Gillian's going to talk about the tags. Right. So, no matter where you are in the world, um, scientists use tools in order to, oops, just tilt that up a bit. 
So scientists use specific tools to help them study sharks. And you may have heard of shark tagging. And there are different types of tags that we can use um, depending on the questions we ask. So if we have a specific question, there are certain tools that we want to use with the sharks to help us answer them. Like, where do they go? What do they eat? Um, how fast do they swim? So they're all tags that can help us do that. Now, the first tag is pretty small. Um, you guys may have a cat or dog at home that's microchipped in case it gets lost. So we actually microchip sharks. Uh, they're called kit tags. And you can see here it's really, really tiny, right? Um, kind of like a grain of rice. And your cat or dog will have this. Uh, injected just between their shoulder blades and for your cat or dog it's going to have uh, a code on it for your family's phone number or um, your address so that if your pet gets lost it can be returned to you. Now we're not trying to return lost sharks but when we catch a shark um, we're going to use this and uh, it's called a scanner. right? So just like think about when you go to the grocery store and your items beep over the register Right? This is kind of like a barcode for shark, right? And this is our scanner. We come up, and when I turn it back on, here we go. Okay, I'm going to scan that tag, and you'll see there's a number. Whoops. There's a, yeah, there's the number. Okay, so that's the shark's ID. It's a really long number, so we have to make sure we write that down. And that's injected just below the dorsal fin of that shark, that top fin just underneath. And it means when we catch sharks, um, we can scan them. All right, no tag, we'll put one in. But if we did find a tag in there, we can look at our data book. So the lab can say, wow, did we, you know, did we find this shark a year ago? We caught it five years ago. We caught it 15 years ago. Um, or somebody else catches the shark. They can say, hey, you know, to the shark lab, we know you guys use these tags. Do you have this number? Have you, is this one of yours? And so scientists can communicate and figure out um, maybe the shark that was caught in Bimini is now hanging out in Florida. All right, that's pretty cool. We learned something that shark knew. Um, another tag we have is a dart tag or Casey tag, um, and it looks kind of like a dart. It's got a point that goes into the shark's skin, and instead of having an internal number, it's got one right on the outside of the tag. You can see that number there. When it's called, all this information is written down, goes in, you can see that number, a little piece of paper inside, and it'll have, if you unroll it, it's got a little contact number you can call. Uh, so if somebody catches the shark or sees the shark, they know who to report that back to. So um, with those two types of tags, though, really have to catch the shark again, somebody else has to catch them, or we have to see them again. Um, so very basic tag um, allows us to just give every animal an identity, right? Um, scientists are catching thousands of sharks all over the world, and you can't just remember them or just say, oh, that's, that's Joe, that's Steve, that's Emma, okay? Uh, now, sometimes they use names for uh, observations. If there's a dive site, you want to you see the same shark all the time. But you still want to have that sort of um, tag that's going to be long-lasting um, and is very specific for that animal. Now, if you think about phones and cameras, technology is constantly changing. Think about what a phone can do these days. It can take really amazing photos, videos. Um, it can give you directions. It knows where you are. All these things that technology is now being used for shark science and science for studying animals in general. So uh, as technology is advancing, so is in our ability to, to use special equipment to learn more about sharks. So one of the tags we have is called an acoustic tag. Um, these come in different sizes and they go either internal in the shark or on the outside. Right, so a surgery can be done. This can be popped in an opening that sharks have sort of in their stomach area with no vital organs. Little cavity, you can pop that in. It'll last for about 10 years, and they're acoustic because they make a noise. So you can think each one of these tags has its own unique ringtone, right? And there's receivers, so we put that in. Now we can use a handheld uh, hydrophone, which is just a big underwater ear that listens specifically for those tags. We can follow the shark. Um, if it's a small shark and it stays in a kind of a, a, a limited area that we can follow it around. Um, but the easier option is to put a receiver down. Now this receiver is an underwater ear that listens just for those tags. Okay, so there's a computer inside that can listen for that and this is protecting it. It's a waterproof case. The receiver can come back up and download the information. And what it gets from those tags, uh, when a shark or fish um, swims by, um, a turtle, they're using different animals as well, swims by, 
uh, that receiver within about 300 to 1500 feet, depending on the type of tag. Um, it records the time, the water temperature, um, the animal, the tag number, and the date. So what this tells us is how often is the shark in the area? Does it just pass by once and it's gone? Or is that shark at that spot every day at 3 o'clock? Right? They know it's snack time. They show up. All right, they're there. Um, and who are they hanging out with? Are they hanging out with their buddies, the same sharks? All right, so this is a tool that has shown that some sharks are really social. They have buddies they hang out with. And you might go, wait, sharks have friends? Some of them do. Some of them are extremely social and spend a lot of time with their friends doing different activities. Now, they're not playing basketball or video games, but they're doing sharky things like hunting and hiding food, hiding out, you know, finding food, and, and really they can learn from each other as well. So it kind of is really interesting that those tags have allowed us to see something that most people don't think of when they think of sharks. Right, now, the last tag I'm going to show you um, is quite a bit fancier. This has really got some interesting technology. Uh, this is like strapping an iPhone to a shark. Okay, so it goes on the dorsal fin of the shark, and the shark will swim around. Now, this nurse shark, we wouldn't want to use this on. Uh, one, it's way too big. Two, this shark doesn't come to the surface a lot. We need this to stick out of the water. Okay, there's a cell on here that needs to touch air for this to go bing up to a satellite, just like your phone connects. You get internet, satellite TV, and a GPS. So inside, this is painted over, but inside you have a mini computer and batteries that power this. So it'll go on the shark. Um, it depends on how many, how often you want the readings, how long the batteries will last, um, anywhere from four to five years. What this does is it tells us where the shark is. Um, so it's like a GPS for sharks, which is really cool. It helps us go, all right, wow, this tiger shark swam a thousand miles south of here. Okay, and then it hung out there for uh, two months. Why did it hang out there in that spot for two months? And then it turned around and came back, right? right we know that lemon sharks uh, are born here in Bimini, and the females leave, and then they come back to give birth here. Right? We know that because of tags like this. Also, um, the receivers having them here seeing the same animals. So things like that. Learning about why they migrate, so why do they travel? Where do they travel to? What's there? What's special? Um, and if they continuously go to a spot, then maybe there's something there. Maybe it's a great food source. Maybe it's where they're giving birth. Maybe it's where they're mating. All really important areas that we want to learn more about because we want to be able to protect those areas. So ultimately, the tags and the data collection that you're going to see in just a minute are, are how we're able to protect sharks. Okay, you might be like, what do you mean? Sharks are big and strong and tough. They don't need our protection. They actually do. So about 100 million sharks are killed globally each year. 100 million which is a giant, terrifying number. And if we don't know about animals, then we don't know how to protect them. So science is how we collect data, and it's how we have facts. We have information about these animals, the habitats they use, the food they eat, where they go, that allows us to go to governments and say, we need to protect this area. So the Bahamas is a shark sanctuary. It means it's illegal to catch and kill sharks here. And that was established in part um, by research done right here in Bimini, other shark research stations, organizations working to protect sharks, because there are habitats here that are really important. Nursery habitats, breeding grounds, very, very important areas. And so it became protected. Um, and those areas of protection, marine protected areas or shark sanctuaries happen because of specific data that's collected about animals, not just sharks, but marine animals in general. So what we're going to show you is when scientists go out and actually catch sharks to collect data is what does that look like and why is it done and how is it done? Hi guys, so I'm going to lead you with Sarah over here in the shark worker. So as Julian said previously, this is the um, how we collect data on the sharks. So it's a set of measurements and biological samples. Now it's standard for all the sharks we, um, we catch. So we, we do this work up on the small juveniles, so they've got all their sharks we've got for us today and the huge big tiger shark. It's the exact same process um, and so we're going to get walk you through it and about how we do it. Now everything we um, we uh, take, all the samples, all the measurements, they get written down in data books. These are essential and they get inputted onto databases that are used globally from different, um, lots of different um, institutions um, and it's essential to have a collaborative network of data on these sharks, different shark species. Sarah and I are going to um, talk you through um, a workup. What we've got here is a measuring trough. 
So as you can see, the sky is very, very small. And um, so we've built this little trough with a tape measure that runs down the bottom of it. So we just want to place it over the tub here and um, fill it up with water so this guy can uh, sort of dark and breathe. Um, and then I'm going to put her and hold her and pop her in um, the tape, um, this little trough. So her snout is touching the zero on the tape mark. And Sarah is going to um, continue with the work up and take some length measurements. These are the first measurements we take on all the sharks. And um, from the small ones to the big ones. Let me just grab this little girl. So lift her up, put her in the trough, wiggle her down just so she can know that she's in some water so that her snout is touching the top. Cool. Hey guys, uh, so we make sure that the snout, the, the snout is where the zero is and then we'll take a couple of measurements. We'll start off with their pre caudal length which is this bit right before where the tail starts. Um, she is about 41 centimeters out of pre caudal length and then nurse sharks, a lot of sharks you can you probably know they have a fork in their tail but nurse sharks don't have that. So usually we'll take the fork length but since she doesn't have one we'll just do the total length which is about 56.4 centimeters. So she's a pretty good size. Um, once we measure the total length, what we wanna see is how big around she is. So we'll measure her girth. So I'll slip the tape measure underneath her and put it under her pet fins into her little armpits and make sure it's right in there. And then see where it is, pinch it, remove it fast and see that she's about 28 centimeters around. So it's just the same as if you go to a, um, a shop and you need to make your waist measurement for a pair of trousers or something like that. Very simple measurements we need, but you need um, to know the size and the girth and how well a shark is doing, because we can work out body condition from these measurements. Um, so next what we want to do is we want to see if, um, well, first we wanted to see if we've had her or not, so we'll scan her with a pit tag reader. Um, and this is so that we know what she, who she is. So it beeped, and it comes up with the number, as you guys can sort of see. Um, that number up there tells us who she is. We'll make sure to write that down, and um, then we can you know, assess if we've cut her, catch her again and see how much she's grown since the previous time we caught her. So every shark gets one of these tags as an yes. identification. So she's a recap, so we've caught her before. If she was a new cat, what we would do would be we would insert a brand new tag to give her a new identification. We do it with this little inserter. Yeah, so it's just this nice little thing, and what we'll do is we'll put it right underneath her first dorsal fin, and it doesn't hurt her very much. It's just kind of like getting a shot at the doctors. It's very quick and it's very, very small. Um, so next what we'll do is we'll take a little fin clip um, from her dorsal fin. Um, what you can see there's like these little notches and it's just like trimming your fingernails. It's a pretty small, um, it doesn't hurt the shark little clip. And what we use that is we use it for DNA and isotopes. So the DNA helps us to create a sort of family tree and see all its relatives. And then Ooh, what we can also do... We lost our audio. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Can you guys hear us now? No? You can? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um... When did you, still no audio. Hmm. Don't. Anything now? Okay, so some people hear us. Some people do not. Um, microphone. All right, can people hear us now? All right, we have two classrooms that can hear us and two that cannot. Um, so we're gonna keep going. Um, let's 
see camera on, unmute, um, audio is up, down, not muted. All right, so uh, yeah, I'm not sure two of the classrooms can hear us. Can the other classrooms hear us now? All right, well, we're gonna keep going. We're almost to questions. So hopefully if you guys can't hear us, hopefully when we get to questions, you'll be able to do that or we'll be able to hear you. Um, so yeah, we're gonna keep going. So we're just gonna carry on with the work up. So we were last at, we were taking um, DNA and isotope sample. So the DNA um, is obviously so we can look at the genetic makeup of these sharks. And that's how lots of different species have been found out is by analyzing their DNA of these different sharks. Um, it's also how, as Sarah said, how we work out um, family trees. And for example, in some of our lemon sharks, we know that they come back to the origin of where they were born. So we, when we tag them and take these DNA samples, we can compare them with um, with other uh, sharks that we've caught to create this huge family tree of um, of these sharks. So it's a super useful tool. And um, we also take um, stable isotopes. So that's for diet analysis. So that's to see what these guys have been eating. All right, well, hopefully um, some of you can hear us. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with the audio, but yeah, we're going to now go to each classroom um, and do some questions. So uh, if you want to, um, if for some reason you can't hear us, if you wanna just type in, um, still no audio, yeah. I, I apologize, guys, I know a couple of you are having some issues. Um, we've got two classes that can hear us, um, so for them, for those um, with no audio, if you want to just type in your questions, um, I think, let me see who it is. So we've got, um, Nancy, you can't hear us at all. Um, yeah. Unmute now. How about now? Does that do anything? All right, well, we're gonna go ahead. Um, Miss Davis, if, okay, we've got two classes left, I guess, that have the audio. So, um, Miss Martin, if you have a couple of questions, uh, if you guys wanna get started, unmute your microphone and let us know if you have a couple of questions. Hey, Isaac, you wanna ask yours? What do you have to do to become a shark researcher? Oh. You can all answer this. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it really depends on what you want to study with sharks. Um, so you can go to university and get a, a degree. There's lots of different things you can study from environmental science, biology, marine biology, um, conservation biology. Um, and then the biggest thing is doing internships. So Sarah's here. Um, we've all been interns and volunteered here at the lab. So um, it's, uh, it's a great way to learn. Um, and getting the experiences, so that's a good way. Learning how to dive, um, being on boats. There's a lot of things that you can do to make sure you learn to have special skills um, so that you can study sharks. Uh, you may want to be out in the field, or you may be someone that's really interested in looking at that DNA, all the tiny stuff. You would work in a lab, um, so you have to learn those skills as well. So um, it really kind of just depends on what sort of research you want to do, how you want to work with sharks, what you want to learn to be able to do that. Yeah, same for me. I went to university, but I also did a lot of diving. I had a diving career as well. So I got a lot of experience in the water first. But it depends which avenue you want to go down, whether you want to work in education, if you want to be a researcher. So you have to have a really, really good think about what you want to do first. Good question. Can I have one more? Okay, hey, Olivia. What can we do to help the shark? Oh, great question. <laughs> well, I'm going to start out with a couple things. One, what you're doing right now. All right, you're learning about them because there's a lot of information out there about sharks that's wrong. They're not man-eating monsters. They're, they're not scary. And they're actually really, really important for healthy oceans. Uh, so just what you're doing today, joining us and learning a little bit more about them um, is definitely something that you can do to help sharks. So awesome that you're here joining us and learning about them. And tell all your friends about them. Tell all your friends how incredible they are, that you've, you've seen them, that they're beautiful, that they're not these really scary big man-eaten monsters. They're all different. And, um, yeah, tell your friends, your family, and um, go and see them. 
try and spend some time in the water and then tell all your friends and family what an incredible experience it was. And I think another thing that you can do is you can learn some, about some of the issues that are affecting sharks right now. That's the biggest way we can help them is to learn what problems there are. So you've probably heard a lot about plastics in the ocean, about lots of fishing, um, overfishing and bycatch of sharks. There is a number of different issues out there that if you learn about them, you probably go to an aquarium and I'll have a little bit um, of, uh, uh, of information about them or through research or through uh, listening and, and, and reading and from different books and stuff like that. And that's a really great way of learning about, about how you can help um, help the sharks um, at home. For example, recycling to, um, to ensure that less plastics get into the ocean is a really great way of knowing that what you're doing is helping a lot of these issues. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I believe then I'm just trying to see who we still have on. Um, so we have Miss Reed's class. Do you have a couple of questions for us? Hey, go ahead. Mia. Hi, my name is Mia. My oh, question... you have to be really loud. Hi, my name is Mia, and my question is what do you feed them? Uh, it kind of depends on the shark, but the ones that we have in our pen, the lemon sharks and these nurse sharks, we feed them grunts, uh, which we catch ourselves. Um, we go fishing and catch the grunts, and then the sharks in the pen, they get some food. It's kind of like a spa vacation for the sharks. They get to be in there and they have food, they get to hang out, and then they go back in the wild. So it's not enough for them to become relying on humans and things like that. That's why they're kept a short amount of time. Um, but they do get fed and uh, fed well so that they're they're happy and healthy and, uh, and then get released back into the wild. You guys have another question? Hey, my name is Noah. Go ahead. Do it now. Okay. Does anybody else have a question? All right. Can you make your way down? Okay. Tell them your name. Hi. My name is Lucian, and I I wonder what you like. I wonder what you like. What you like? Let them swimming. Like to like like keep like water over them. Why, why do we want to keep them in the water? Yeah, to keep water over them. Yeah, well, can, when you go in the water, do you have to hold your breath? Yeah, but sharks have well, their own gale. To a lot of them water. Yeah, they don't breathe air. So they don't breathe air, so we can't. If they're up here, they can't breathe. So we have to lift them up quick and then put them back in the water. So we want to keep the water on them because that's how they're able to breathe. Just like we go... And we're able to breathe, that's what the shark can do, but it has to be in the water. We have to have the water going over their gills in order to get out that oxygen. So we want to leave that shark in the water. We can lift it up quick, show you guys, put it back. Um, we don't want to leave it out of the water for any amount of time because that's how it's able to breathe. Okay. Yeah. All right, we're going to go back um, to uh, have Ms. Martin's class. We're going to go back to two more questions. Bye. Yeah, why do you care? My name is Isaac. Why do you care so much about sharks? We care so much about sharks because they're amazing. We can make them protected. It should be in our region. I lost our audio. Find a really healthy ocean. They've got to be there. We've got to protect them. We've got to look after them. They're responsible for making sure our ocean. Healthy and also, they remove all of the sick and uh, diseased fish. Um, this is what they they will eat, and they remove all the sick and diseased animals out of the ocean because that will eventually affect us because we eat fish as well. So, if we were to eat the fish, the sick and the disease, that would make us very sick too. So, we really need sharks. To help us remove all of the, the, the fish that is going to be fat for uh, I just love sharks. I want to be a voice for sharks. That's why I'm doing the things that I'm doing in Boston. Because I'm getting that hands on experience with the sharks. 
learning a lot about them so that I can then teach other people about them. Right? Thank you. Yeah. All right. Do you want to do one more, and then we'll go back to our other class to finish off? Hi, my name is Olivia. Which is your favorite shark? Oh, oh wow. wow. <laughs> My, yeah. We might not have the same one. Yeah. Uh, is, uh, we need to see. Remarkable animal, um, really special, really beautiful. Um, and we're lucky to get to some of them here in the um, second year. So, my favorite. Um, my favorite is, wait, how many But See, Ms. Celia talked about it. I'll say my second favorite is the whale shark. Um, the whale shark, you probably heard about it. It's the biggest fish in the ocean. They can get around them, like as big as a bus. They are huge, but they just swim around all day with their mouths open, eating the tiny, tiny bugs. And they're just really beautiful animals, and they just—they're very curious, very inquisitive, um, and they're just absolutely incredible to look at. They're my second favorite. Uh, my favorite shark is the tiger shark. I'm sure you've probably all heard of that and heard that it's a scary shark. It is not a scary shark at all. It's an amazing shark. It's got these incredible shark on it. Right? Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're very small, but they're very big, and that's the That you have about sharks. Uh, yes. Right. So I see Miss Davis returns. So Miss Davis, if your class, if you can hear us, if your class has a couple of questions. They do. Uh, can you hear us? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. We're good now. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, Patrick, come on up. Oh, yes, come up. You have to come up to close oh. to the microphone. <laughs> Quickly. Oh, All right. Oh. Tell them your name. Say hi. I'm hi, I'm Patrick. Hi. And my question. Uh, nice my, and loud. My question is, uh, how many different species of sharks are there? Oh, there's around 500, 503, 503. Yeah, it's so about just over 500 species of shark. But we're discovering new sharks all the time. So um, now we're able to go a little bit deeper in the ocean. Um, we're able to discover more sharks in the deep ocean than we've ever seen before. And there's um, a shark that we've just recently discovered is um, around 350 years old, and that's the Greenland shark. And we're able to discover, we discover new species all the time. Even though we knew about this shark, we didn't actually know how old they get. So we're finding all new information and all new species all the time. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, come on up. You could probably, okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Mike. Louder. Hi, Mike. And my question is what's the biggest shark in the world? Uh, so, Andy mentioned it's the whale shark. So, they're um, anywhere 45 to 50 feet longer than a school bus. So, they're the biggest shark, the biggest fish in the sea. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, right. One more, and then we're going to finish off with our other class. One more. Hi, I'm Avery, and I was wondering how big do great white sharks get? So, um, great whites are anywhere, probably average is about 15 to 16 feet. They can get bigger than that, but and 15 to 16 feet certainly isn't the biggest shark but they're really wide. They're very, very large, very big animals. So um, we have tiger sharks and, and hammerheads that are that long here in Bimini, but they're not nearly as wide or kind of as thick and big. Um, great whites are just like, they're a bus themselves. They're a very large animal underwater, but average size, anywhere from about 15 to 16 feet. Um, they can get bigger, some are a bit smaller, depends, um, but still a really large, amazing animal. All right, thank you for the questions. We're gonna go back to Miss Reed's class to finish us off with a couple of questions. Patrick, can you just quickly see if Peter's open? Okay. <laughs> Reed, we, um, let me see, I'll go ahead and unmute you, Miss Reed. Uh, let's see. 
Oh, you're gonna have to unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. Okay, there you go. Nice one. Right up here. Hi. Hi, my name is Maxwell. How strong can sharks get? Well, they're all, I mean, angiomas is the cartilage, right? So they're made, um, their skeleton is made of cartilage, but they have a lot of muscle, right? So you saw that little animal she was moving around. She's really strong, even at that size. Um, I don't know that it's specific as like, you can lift a 50 pound dumbbell, and it's not like what we think of how strong humans are, but they are made of muscle, so they're incredibly strong. Their movements um, and how they're able to, like, and turn and move around, but you think it helps them swim. Those muscles have to help them move, uh, especially sharks that have to keep swimming all the time. Uh, so it really depends on the shark, but one thing in common is they're all incredibly strong. They all have a lot of muscle, um, which helps them move around and function. Great question. I have one more to finish this off. Thanks, Max. That's awesome. All right. You make your way down to the dumbass. Do we have any other questions? Okay, Mason, go ahead. Hurry up. Mason, Mom, Mike, break to your face. Hi, my name is Mason. Um, uh, is this thing on? Oh, put it on. Um, <laughs> my, my name is um, uh, Mason, and uh, my, my question is, uh, what inspired you to, like, do what you do? Oh, yeah. I think we can um, I saw my first shark and swam with it when I was eating a shark like this and was fascinated with them. Uh, so uh, that really inspired a whole life of wanting to learn more about them. And and saw very quickly that people don't know them. And I had really amazing experiences to learn more and also to share their about them, how can I get others to learn and, and want to, to help them as well? So really just an experience I had when um, I was a little bit younger than you guys uh, that really about the same age, I guess, um, that inspired me to want to work with sharks. And for me, it was when I was working in my uh, diving career and I used to take people on a shark snorkel and I used to take them to a little bay in Thailand and there was always some baby, baby black tits there. And they were just the cutest little things around the same size or maybe a little bit bigger as a snail shark. So that created a passion in me. And then when I was at university, or oh, just before I went to university, I watched a film called Shark Water um, by an incredible human. And um, it's all about the shark fin in the industry. And it just, I just, from watching that, I wanted to protect sharks. So that's why I got into shark conservation. For me, um, Maybe my mom used to take me diving because I was uh, very small and we grew up going on holidays and going diving each time. And we used to see sharks. We used to go to the Red Sea quite a lot. And we used to see lots of uh, little sharks there while we were there. And then I noticed years later that there were less and less sharks I was seeing in the Red Sea. So that really got me interested in conservation. Um, and that was where um, my passion for sharks grew and my um, need to work in an industry that helps um,